Okay. Finally, it's time. Time to talk about the most divisive and controversial portrayal of Starfire ever. This show may have ended over a year ago, but its effects on the Teen Titans fandom are still alive and well. So we're gonna get into all of it. We've got four seasons worth of designs to analyze, writing choices to critique, and backlash to unpack. But wait, there's more. We've got fandom lies and conspiracies, toxic positivity and support, and a certain side of the fandom's rejection of an actress all for failing the brown paper bag test. I won't be doing any full episode breakdowns here because I've already watched as much Titans as I can possibly stand without going on a grippy sock getaway. So strap in as we begin to break down Anna Jope's portrayal of Starfire, who will henceforth be dubbed as Anna Fire. But first we have to set the stage. Let me show you something! Released in 2018, the show debuted on the now defunct streaming service DC Universe. It ran for four seasons until its cancellation in 2023. Some fans found the gritty reinterpretation as too far of a departure from the titans of the comics or the cartoons, while others welcomed the change of pace, or at the very least, were willing to check it out and see how it played out. But it was definitely a proceed with caution type of interest on my part. The Teen Titans always walked a balance of light and heavy story elements since the days of the new Teen Titan comics. And even though a lot of fans resented the O3 cartoon for its over-the-top humor and various character changes, that show knew when to be serious and play things straight. The strong sense of found family bonds and hilarious character interactions softened the blow from the title's harsher elements. So how did the Titans first romp into live action choose to adapt these elements? Fuck Batman. They come off as an edgy teen's attempt to make the Teen Titans cool or more adult. And this doesn't even touch on the downgrades made to the designs, backstories, powers, or character arcs. Some changes are less egregious than others, but any character who's distinctly a metahuman or an alien, don't even look at them. Why do Teen Titans if you're not gonna make them Teen Titans? I mean, look at Donna Troy. Yes, they knocked it out the park with the casting. Her outfit is one of the absolute best in the whole show. And I really like her dynamic with the team. She's one of the only members of the Titans who actually seems like a friend and ally, and not someone who's just there because the plot needs her to be there. But her strength and abilities are all nerfed throughout the entire show, to such a degree that she... well, we'll get there when we get there. Y'all are lucky this isn't a Beast Boy stan account. How many different animals total did he turn into over the course of four seasons? Like five? But we're not here to trash the Titans as a whole. We're here to talk about Starfire. We'll start each section off by going over each season's respective look. And for season one, her outfit just sucks. Literal dumpster juice. The hair, the coat, the boots, trash. You've probably heard and maybe even thought or said at one point that this outfit makes her look like a hooker slash stripper. But Starfire has worn plenty of risque or provocative outfits before, even gone around full-blown naked at times. For me, it's down to the fact that aside from it just being aesthetically horrendous, this is how we spend our first season with Starfire in live action. She is like this the whole time. It feels like one of those 90s or early 2000s superhero movies where they would find a way to give them some casual half-assed reference to something they wore in the source material, but they didn't want to commit either for budgetary reasons or because they didn't think it would quote unquote work. Absolute God tier trash. Uh, she has a purple outfit in the comics, so we're gonna get her a purple dress. Yeah, a dress that we can hardly ever see because she's wearing this ugly ass faux mink coat. Really, it's the coat that just kills the outfit for me. And the Party City wig? Tell me she don't look like she got this wig from the same place Batwoman got her wig from. And let's go ahead and discuss the elephant in the room. The fact that our Anna Fire, our live action Starfire, portrayed by the beautiful Anna Jope, 
is decidedly not orange or gold if we're talking about pre or post crisis Starfire. Her skin does have this orange glowing effect sometimes when she uses her powers, but that's it. Almost like there's a nuclear reaction going on under her skin. It's really not her skin changing color for real. Her eyes also glow green at various points in time, and her hair does get an appropriately fiery quality. But again, it's only when her powers are in use at certain times. And while I have absolutely no problem with Anna Jope's casting, I do have a problem with the showrunners deciding to take a character who literally is one of the most inhuman looking people on the team and taking the most recognizable physical traits that she has and choosing to leave those out. People tuned in to see Starfire. They want Starfire. But the looks really are just the icing on the shit cake. And to be completely honest, if the way that she looked was the only problem and everything else was on point, I could live with it. That may be a hot take, but I would forgive her visual design. So what did they actually have Starfire do in season one of Titans? <laughs> What the shit? Who are you? What do you want from me? I don't know. After a car crash, Cory spends the majority of season one having no idea who she is or why she's wherever she is at any given time. So even if Starfire was written in character, she doesn't know who that character is when we meet her. She just looks at everything with this confused face of, what is this? Who am I? Why can I do this? But to be clear, the main issue is not that she's just different. I would prefer that as a freshly adapted character for live action, she was kept mostly in character. But even if things were done differently, I think most fans would grow to like this version or at least accept them if they were actually good. And what we got in season one just wasn't. Take her fight scenes for example. She does actually fight at least, but the choreography is so bare bones. It's just screaming middle schoolers first fight scene. And they should be able to come up with something that looks better than this. Hell, we know they can come up with something better than this. We watch Dick Grayson get in multiple fights and every one of them actually looks like something like Robin slash Nightwing would do. So why is it that we can watch the boy wonder actually look like he knows how to do more than just throw a straight punch, but then we get to the literal alien warrior princess and her fight scenes look like something out of G1 Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Like literally if you put her up next to them putty monsters, looks exactly the same. Life is not fair. Life sucks. But what about the powers? The powers got to be on point, right? Oh yes, the powers. The powers, you mean the literal streams and balls of fire that she emits. Not beams of solar energy, not eye lasers or orbs. Well, I mean, she's her name is Starfire, right? She's from the stars and she emits fire. Wrong. I'm sorry? On the board. Wrong. Wrong. But what about her actual character arc? Surely they had to do something with that. Okay, well, let's go through her season one character arc. Coriander, crown princess of Tamaran, was sent to Earth to kill Raven. Cause gotta stop Trigon. And on the way to learning this, we get to watch Starfire kill a bunch of Russian gangsters, fuck up some cops who were just doing their jobs, including a guy who she was torturing the previous night for reasons that we never learn. A guy who she would kill after extracting information from him, after she had just beaten the dog shit out of this man. And before you say she was defending herself, no. She knocked a man twice her size at least several feet across the room with one punch. 
This man was effectively unconscious with just enough awareness to answer her questions. He was not a threat to her at all. She does eventually meet and befriend Raven and actually saves her from this evil family who had kidnapped her. That's pretty cool. She also meets and sleeps with Dick not long after meeting him. See which comics they were reading. She regains her memory slowly over time, but this doesn't happen until the end of the freaking season. Now before going into season 2, I want to break down exactly what's so frustrating about the way she acts, looks, and fights, considering how these things actually do improve over the course of the show. Not by much, and the backstory and writing for this character actually gets significantly worse, if you can believe it. But, we'll deal with that when we get there. One thing you'll hear from this show's defenders is, let the show be its own thing. And I do think adaptations should have the freedom to forge their own paths. But in my opinion, when something is adapted to a number of different mediums for the first time, it's really important to establish these characters and who they are at their core. That way existing fans get what they showed up for and new fans can get to know the characters. Then once that's all in place, you can start doing things differently, forging your own paths, going your own way, etc, etc. Even if some things are going to be changed, it can be done in a way that keeps the character's core intact. Take the O3 Cartoon Network Starfire, for example. That iteration of the character amplified certain traits while diminishing others. She's goofier and more of a clear fish out of water than she was in the comics. But both traits are part of who she is at her core. She's a caring, optimistic, fun-loving person who wears her emotions on her sleeve. And she doesn't always fit in with Earth's society that she now calls home. The show played those elements up, but they were always there in the comics. And with the target demographic of the cartoon being what it was, they're obviously not going to have her killing people. But from the moment we meet her, we know that she has a warrior's edge and a no-nonsense approach to danger and combat. And that is pure Starfire. That's peak Starfire. At the same time, she's not a bloodlust-driven person. In a similar vein, they can't portray her as being openly sexual for the same reasons. But they compensated for that by making her very physically affectionate. Please, where do you come from? How did you get here? What is your favorite color? Do you wish to be my friend? Um, Earth, Walked, Red, and... Sure. <gasps> Hello, new friend! Uh, oh, oh, that... Better? Uh, much. Thanks. I welcome you. Welcome to our universe, small amusing doppelganger. <laughs> the Cartoon Network show is a great example of how to faithfully adapt a character who you have to make certain changes to in order to make it more suitable for a different audience. It's the complete opposite of what happened in Titans, where all of her character traits are either completely removed or so diluted that they're barely noticeable. So all of this just spells doom for the show going forward. Because right out the gate, they told Starfire fans that the character they showed up for is not here. Or if she is here, she's buried under layers of crap that weren't even fully peeled back by the end of the season. It's a tall order to ask for people to deal with episode after episode of unfulfilling, badly written, badly paced superhero melodrama just to maybe at some point get a version of the characters that they actually recognize. Every time I sit down to watch any part of this show, Anna Jope is usually one of maybe two or three people who even looks like she gives a damn about what's happening. You can tell she's really putting her all into the role, and it's only more frustrating that the show didn't bother to make her look or act like it. But let's move on to season two because <laughs> it gets so much worse. He was stronger than I expected. What do you want, Blackfire? Her season 2 outfits are way better. She actually dresses like she gives a shit about fashion. It's so weird that I'm making that statement about Starfire, the woman who's been a model in the comics. She actually dresses like she has some sense now. And the outfits actually do look pretty okay. They don't really give off alien or superhero, 
she looks more like a businesswoman from the near future or church lady who's somewhat high in the church hierarchy. But it is a far cry from that eyesore she wore in season one. Her personality is also way more likable now. She doesn't have a constant attitude mixed with confusion every time she's on camera. Still doesn't quite feel like Cory though. She has two main speeds in season two, assertive and chill. And I'm sorry, but does that sound like Starfire to you? Cause it damn sure doesn't to me. Starfire proudly wears her emotions on her sleeve, and she's often at odds with her placement in Earth society because of who and what she is. I can't think of a single instance in this show where I got the feeling that Cory was genuinely out of place simply because of who she was. I don't really hate her season 2 portrayal, but it's just not hitting. Actually, this season has relatively little in terms of Starfire fuckery, so let's just breeze through the plot summary because, oh, we gotta get to season three. <laughs> we gotta get there because it gets so bad. So after the supremely disappointing introduction and defeat of Trigon that all happens in one episode, Cory goes to Chicago to pal around with Donna Troy as a part of this sting operation or something. I warned y'all I wasn't getting deep into the plot because most of the time it literally doesn't matter. Point to this show though for actually portraying her friendship with Donna Troy, who, if you don't read the comics, is her longtime best friend. People who are more familiar with the O3 cartoon may think of Raven as her BFF, but it was Donna first, and arguably still is to this day, although she and Raven are also good friends. And I do like how they do have a little bit of banter between each other, like when they're on the sting operation. Did you get any jellies? No one likes jellies. Maybe not on Tamarind, but humans love jellies. It's kind of why we invented them. Oh, so now you're human. Got it. I'm half human. That half really likes jellies. But it's nice to know that they did take care to give Cory some type of actual personality beyond just person. Oh, but don't worry, if you hate this show, don't think that I'm giving it too much credit for them including Donna Troy's friendship with Starfire, because they also kill off Donna Troy in the stupidest way possible. <laughs> when I say I hate this show, <laughs> I mean I'm willing to commit hate crimes. Anyway, let's move on. We finally meet another Tamaranian named Fide, a former guard of Starfire's and an old fling of hers. He says he's come to escort Starfire back to Tamaran if she chooses to return. But it turns out that he's actually under the control of Blackfire. Cory fries Fide to a crisp to free him from Blackfire's control, because of course she does. And Blackfire's a complete bitch who hates Cory. But despite this fact, she offers Cory a chance to rule Tamaran with her. Now, why is she in charge and not her parents? Glad you asked. Answer, because Blackfire killed them. Never even seen Tamaran yet and already the parents dead. I love it when they do stupid shit for no reason. What about her brother? What brother? They don't mention his ass in this. She don't got no damn brother. She got one sister and she here. But nonetheless, their epic sisterly reunion is teased for season three. But before we get there, Starfire has to start losing her powers. Another time-honored superhero trope. Also, we get Deathstroke as the big bad this season, and somehow he feels even more underwhelming than Trigon. Two for two! Two for fucking two, DC! I know. I'm hot. Our introduction to Anna Fire this season is actually, unironically, the best she's ever looked in the show. First of all, the outfit actually looks alien. I don't think it's designed very well, as it's another thing that makes me think she should be in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers instead of Titans, but at least I can tell she's not from Earth. Also, she's doing a bunch of bang and fight moves and heals, and I'm always here for that. But the suit, I'm not feeling it a whole lot. And it's not even for the most obvious reason, like she's being covered up a lot. She's had outfits that are less revealing in the comics, one of which was full-blown Space Commander during the New 52. And there's also that pants and sleeves look she had from the 90s that a lot of people don't like, but I think actually looks pretty okay, at least as far as more covered Starfire looks go. My problem is that it's too much going on. It's just way too much going on. It's just 
everything going everywhere all at once. This is too busy. This is all too busy! By the time you read it, you're dead! But what really chaps my ass about this thing, I mean what truly brings my piss to a boil, is that we had to sit through two whole goddamn seasons to get this. Where does she get this outfit from? I don't know. Don't know! And we never find out. Also, her powers are back now, and they're better. We literally meet her descending in a fire force field. And yes, I did say descending, so she couldn't fly before. Oh, did I not mention that? She couldn't fucking fly in seasons one and two. Okay, okay, okay. Why did we end the season two with her either not having her powers or not having full control over her powers, and now she can do more shit with her powers? Don't know! And do they bother to tell you? <laughs> None of this matters. Anyway, her personality's better, so that's a good thing. She actually is a pretty lively and upbeat person at times. The mayor has called you and the Titans San Francisco's guardian angels. How do you respond to that? Well, the Titans are happy to do everything we can to protect the city, but the real angels are the men and women without powers. They show us that if we all do our part together, we can really create change. Good answer. Good answer. What were you thinking shutting this operation down? It could have been great! Editing Animane here, and I just had to come in real quick to derail whatever point I'm making, giving points to Starfire, because I just remembered one of the absolute worst things that she's ever done in this show. This was the thing that made me put this show down and walk away back when it was first coming out this scene and another scene we're gonna talk about with Beast Boy in a minute. So Jason Todd gets killed in this season. Surprising no one, it's Jason Todd. What threw me was Starfire's reaction to it. She has gotten in people's faces and damn near fought them because similar things happened in the comics and they would talk bad about a team member of hers after they were killed. The whole team would have to hold her back she was so mournful of Donna Troy when she died that she would straight up make shrines for her and pray to the goddess Zal to give her soul safe passage to the afterlife. So how does Anna Fire deal with the death of a teammate? I'm so angry. At the Joker? No. At Jason. When Jason left the Titans to go to Gotham, he was alone and angry and I get that, but Dick was hoping he'd figure things out with Bruce, but he never did. He clearly just kept making the same mistakes over and over and that finally got him killed. Don't let that happen to you. I gave this version so many good points and I think my brain just deleted whatever the fuck this was. It just couldn't handle the trauma of seeing Coriander speak this terribly about a dead teenager. This is a dead teenager who was the most troubled member of the team who needed people's support and love probably more than any other single member aside from maybe Raven. He was treated like trash for the entire show. Now he's dead and you're blaming him. You're blaming a murdered teenager for not having his shit together and getting killed. Fuck this show. Now back to our scheduled program. The personality and some of the powers decided to catch up and actually start looking like Starfire. But it doesn't even matter because the show just makes no goddamn sense. So visions, right? She starts getting these visions. They come completely out of nowhere. Usually they're of herself that looks like she's chained to a hospital bed that's being wheeled through some facility. But if it's not that, then she's imagining herself in the middle of traffic and all types of really distressing situations. When these visions are happening, in the real world, she starts speaking Tamaranian uncontrollably and becomes irrationally hostile. Whenever someone tries to talk to her or touch her during these random moments, she just goes completely apeshit. Where's Alfred when you need him? <laughs> Sorry. Joke. Stop, stop. <laughs> Turns out that these visions are connected to Blackfire and actually being projected into Corey's mind from Blackfire. And this is when the show's shit factor just gets ramped up to 110,000. So remember that tease we had of Blackfire and Starfire's reunion back in season two? Turns out Starfire didn't have to look far because Blackfire was already on Earth. At the end of season two, 
we see her morphing into some random mother in a grocery store parking lot and she like punches this dude into a car. But whatever happened, it doesn't matter because she's currently being held at this government facility because she got captured. That's right. She was on Earth this whole time and they got her in a jail cell complete with power dampeners. How do they know how to make a Tamaranian an alien that they had previously had no known contact with weak? Don't know. But they just have her because they have her. Because it fucking sucks. Because it fucking sucks. Because it fucking, because it fucking sucks. Anna Fire and Beast Boy follow the visions to the facility and through the power of sisterly telepathy, I guess, Starfire is led to Blackfire's location. Now, during their first face-to-face -face meeting, Coriander beats the ever-loving dog shit out of Commander, very on brand. But then they get into an argument that makes you think that they're actually gonna start doing something dope with these characters just to let you down. They start going over all the different ways one has fucked the other one over, whose fault it was that the other one's childhood was so painful. They really trick you into thinking that we're really gonna get into their dynamic. But it's not long for us to find out that all this buildup was wasted and it is ruined. I want to real quick talk about Starfire and Blackfire just as characters. These two have to have one of the most exciting, insane sibling at odds relationships. They start off hating each other and it gradually builds into a begrudging alliance, but there is some trust and mutual respect. I'm working on a video covering them in depth because their whole relationship is a trip. But if you were expecting to get even a piece of that in this show, don't hold your breath. All of the rich complexity of their volatile relationship is gone, replaced by convolution and melodrama. Here, they're more like estranged sisters who are at odds with each other because of some misunderstandings. Misunderstandings that begin to get cleared up pretty fast when Commander tells Cory the real reason why she killed their parents. You see, this whole time, Cory thought Blackfire had staged a coup and killed their parents in the process. And given Blackfire's history, that's not hard to imagine. But according to Commander, it was actually in self-defense. Okay, Commander escapes with Cory and Beast Boy, crashes at the Titan's place, and once she tells Cory the truth, that's it. Everything's cool now. It's cool. She just joins the team. She's still kind of a bitch to people, but it's more like she's annoying. It's not like she's evil and is plotting to kill us all. She even starts dating Connor. Beautiful, be be beautiful, beautiful. Midge, what? Okay, it's obviously not that simple, but compared to the roller coaster of a relationship they have outside of the show, it may as well have happened literally as I described it. And I really do mean outside of this show, not just the comics. Once again, let's take a look at the O3 cartoon, which took liberties with the life events and dynamic of Commander and Coriander. But when we're introduced to Blackfire in the cartoon, we really learn everything we need to know about both sisters to understand their complex dynamic and connect with it. Starfire's the younger, optimistic sister who's constantly having to answer for Blackfire's misdeeds. We see this clearly when Blackfire frames Cory for her crimes after just wooing the Teen Titans and having them eating out of the palm of her hand. And Starfire's of two minds about it. You can tell she wants her sister to do good and to have a good relationship with her, but not at the cost of her own well-being or that of others. When push comes to shove, she'll lay the smack down on her big sister. But she still holds out hope that one day she won't be an unrepentant piece of shit. Even with the changes that the cartoon made to their backstories, it's still a faithful adaptation in my opinion, because you still get that same feeling of, I really can't stand you for what you did, and I will beat the tar out of you if I have to. But if you actually turned over a new leaf, I'd be here for it. And you're my sister, so I'm gonna stand up for you. But fuck you still. Just another example of how you can adapt something and make creative changes without fundamentally altering the spirit of the thing you're adapting. Let's get back to Cory's greatest enemy literally joining the good guy team after we just meet her in person. Yippee Skippy. 
To be fair, the show does try to reignite the tension between the sisters by introducing a new plot point that's actually super specific to Starfire. And it has to do with her powers. Those wonderful, wonderful literal flame powers that I just can't get a fuck enough of. Commander gets injured. No! Cory tries to heal her by imparting some of her fire energy into Commander. How that works, I don't know. And then... What's going on? What are you doing? Let's go! No! Now, how does that work? Say it with me. I don't know! Does the show explain it sufficiently? Of course not! Of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course! Yeah! But I think what's more interesting in how that happened is why that happened. And for that, we're gonna head over to the Titans Wiki. Coriander was unfortunately not born with the royal powers of fire, which Tamaranian culture deems to be a sign of a royal's birthright to the throne. Despite this, her father ordered that she be deceptively pronounced as born with the gift of fire and the rightful successor to the Tamaranian throne. When her younger sister Commander was born with the gift of fire, King Meander ordered that the newborn's powers be magically transferred to Coriander and the true nature of the sister's powers be kept secret. He did this to maintain his lie and prevent any uprising that could happen if the people were to learn of his deception. Reality can be whatever I want. It don't matter. None of this matters. See, Commander is supposed to be the older sister who was born without the ability to fly, which was actually why she was hated and maligned so much as a kid. Also, she was born on the same day of a huge attack from the Tamaranian's mortal enemies, the Citadel, and so she's just generally seen as a bad omen. And when Coriander was born, this was the royal family's second chance, and so they just heaped all of that love onto Coriander. Plus, she was just a pretty dope baby. She was kind of one of those babies that you just can't help but love, even when she's getting into some bullshit. I think Coriander's probably in the top 10 dopest babies of all time. While this 1000% does not excuse Commander for any of the terrible things she did, you can understand why she ended up feeling the way she did. So that's how it went down in her actual origin. But this time, they actually flipped things on us. Now, Coriander is the older sister, but Commander is still the one that suffered. They ripped her powers out of her and gave them to Cory to keep up a lie that the king started. So Cory goes on to become the beloved crown princess while Commander is shunned and ignored. Cory gets all the cool training, she gets tasked to go to Earth to kill Raven to keep Trigon from destroying the universe, she is the rightful queen of Tamaran. Cory and Commander had plenty of reasons to be at odds with each other, and all of them made sense without having to involve power stealing mystics that literally rob a baby of her birthright. Not to mention, they undercut Starfire as a character. This whole time, these powers that she's been using aren't even hers. Now personally, I'm not gonna lose any sleep over that because it's these powers, but it's still her powers. And I know for a fact that there are fans of this show who actually really like the way her powers look in the show. And now, she just don't have no powers. Well, she does, it's okay, cause she actually does have powers, they're blue. She shoots blue stuff out her hands, and it can do things. It can do a lot of different things. It can blow stuff up, even though it moves very slow. It's, it's just stuff, it's just blue, it's not even green. Why didn't they make them green? I do not understand that, because the green star bolts are the most iconic star bolts, and you don't make them green, you, you, you make them blue. So she went from being born without powers, to having blue mystery powers, that were either suppressed or lying dormant. And this was not the plan for season three. You cannot convince me that this is what they actually had planned for season three back in season two. No way in hell. That Blackfire setup was the biggest oh my god moment of the entire show up at that point. But then we get this. 
They have one fight scene. It's kind of ass because her combat is still ass. Like Blackfire's fighting style actually looks way more like what I would expect Starfire to fight like. And then she just joins the team. It's not like we've been with her for like two or three seasons and we've seen her go through like a significant amount of growth. And um, you know, all this stuff, it's not even the focus of season three. What was the actual A plot of season three? Oh, of course, this is Titans we're talking about. One more season to go. How much worse can it get? Life is not fair. Life sucks. Outfit's the same, but now she has straight hair. Big whoop, don't care. Moving on. I'm tired of the show. Her fight scenes are arguably better. Her fighting style is still ridiculously slow. That's the main problem I have with it. It's so sluggish. They don't scream trained alien warrior to me. She fights more like just a tougher and stronger than average woman who grew up on the streets. To be fair, most of her fights in the comics don't really have a whole lot of refined form to them, but you can still tell that she knows what the fuck she's doing. She grew up doing this. She was literally trained by warlords and warriors who study and practice the art of war like a religion. Anna Fire don't fight like that. Also, things like form are less important when you're looking at still pictures versus things in motion. But that's just me. Now, when they start having her fight like she fought in them DC AMU movies, give me a call. But in any case, it's still the best Starfire fighting we've gotten in the show. And seeing as how this is the last season, this is as good as it's gonna get. But we gotta keep moving. We gots to keep it moving because it's time to have more visions. This time, they're of a little girl holding a red balloon. Now this just happens to be Dick and Corey's future daughter. She's never named in the show, but I'm gonna take the liberty of calling her Mary because that is the name of Starfire's actual daughter in the comics from an alt universe, Mary Grayson. Starfire only has the one daughter ever. She, she does have a son from a different continuity, but only one daughter. So this is Mary. Are these visions just the writers trying to make it look like they actually know what they're doing? Yes. Oh, and uh, Brother Blood's the final big bad. Another iconic Teen Titans villain who is only here to not get utilized in any interesting way. Brother Blood's ultimate plan involves taking over Star Labs to access the Icarus Project, a device that can open up a wormhole to anywhere in the universe. Then he can send Earth hurtling towards the planet of Tamaran to destroy both planets. He would like to rule both of them, but he also doesn't want them to team up, so he's just going to destroy them both because he's Frieza. So Coriander, aka the Tamaranian Chosen One, again, decides to use her blue light powers to confront Brother Blood. Yes, that is their actual name in the show. Doesn't matter, cause Brother Blood's like, nah, it'll be fine. And he takes them powers of hers and says, I'ma use you as a battery. He's going the route of Darkseid, more or less. And is like, I'm gonna use you to power my bullshit machine. Put a pin in that because it is about to be even more relevant. When Brother Blood's gauging Starfire's power level, the computer clocks her energy output as the equivalent as 10,089 suns. The Icarus gate requires 1,000 zenijoules to become fully operative. Equivalent to the thermal solar output of 10,000 suns. 10,089 Earth suns. A typical Tamaranian can generate well over 1,000 zenijoules of energy. What? This would make live-action Starfire insanely powerful. Stronger than she is in the comics, perhaps. Remember what I said earlier about them hate crimes? Let me explain. I've touched on this in my Starfire Power Breakdown video, 
but gaining an accurate power level for Starfire is not an easy task at all. Due to all the retcons and general inconsistencies that she's been plagued with over the years. The closest we have comes in the Justice League Odyssey storyline, where she becomes a herald of Darkseid. She's used as the spark for a pocket universe called Sepulchor, which required an energy source equal to five hypernovae to activate. A single hypernova occurs when a massive star dies, and by massive I mean at least 30 times larger than our sun. The only known type of explosion that outclasses that is the Big Bang itself. And Starfire is apparently walking around with five of them things inside of her at any given time. For my power scalers, that comfortably puts our alien warrior hippie princess anywhere from high stellar to low cosmic. AKA, she's fucking shit up on the galactic scale if she were truly to use all her power. But for live action Starfire, you gotta crank that bitch up to 10,000 plus suns worth of energy. And a being with the power of 10,000 suns, I can't see being anything less than low universal. Why am I harping on this point so much? It's just a random throwaway moment. They say how much power she has, Brother Blood's like, that's perfect, you can power my bullshit machine. It should be a nothing moment, right? Wrong, sir. Wrong. Because with her being that strong, why in the name of Zal do we never see anything close to that from Anifier for the whole fucking show? We sit through two seasons of horrendously lackluster firepowers, one season of kinda okay firepowers, and now that's replaced by weird random ass blue light powers for the final season and we learn that those are her actual powers and depending on whether or not I am literally brain dead when I'm judging how strong 10,000 suns worth of power is, she may just be a couple hairs away from actual literal superman level powers with zero demonstration. Just slap me in the face with the proverbial balls of disappointment. That sucks. So anyway, she's tied up and she's about to be used as a battery and the portal opens up. But with the help of the Titan, she is freed. Then she drags Brother Blood into the sky and takes him out with her ultimate move, the Supernova. What the fuck is that? You remember Coneheads? Remember the scene where they're at like the football game? Dan Aykroyd's character has like Conehead fireworks. <laughs> That looked more impressive than Cory Supernova. HATE CRIMES! Anyway, the Titans have saved the world and they go their separate ways, which doesn't mean anything because they break up at least once per season. Dick and Cory can now have a proper relationship because until now, they weren't truly in a relationship, they just really liked each other and kept fucking, but they never truly full-blown got together and now they can actually have a proper relationship that we never get to see because the show is over and they all lived happily ever after. It sucks, monkey butts like all the fucking rats. There's a lot to say and very little of it is good. And the same can be said for the discourse around the character. But before we start getting into that, I wanna make something very clear. Cause I have a lot of viewers who actually ride for Anifier. I need you to understand. I am not only okay with you liking Anifier, I'm happy for you. I really am. Different interpretations of characters are gonna appeal to different people. Just like I'm partial to New Teen Titans Cory. Part of my audience can't stand that version. They think her design is absolute trash. I appreciate the ability for fans to have different opinions and talk about them civilly. I just wish we could do the same with Anifier. So why is that? As with most things, it's never as simple as the other guys are bad, it's all their fault. And I'll be the first to acknowledge the role that critical fans have played in making the very mention of Anifier a dumpster fire. But we gots to have us a conversation. Now a common rebuttal from Anifier supporters is, y'all are just mad that she's not like the cartoon. This version is based more off New Teen Titans Cory, where she would kill and she was much more brutal. She does have that willingness to kill in the show that was present in the comics. That's something that the cartoon doesn't do for obvious reasons. 
But again, to say that Anifier and NTT Cory are the same because they both use lethal force is a surface level observation at best and a disingenuous argument at worst. Let me explain. Hailing from a warrior culture and being ritualistically trained for combat, Starfire in the comics is not only in peak physical and mental condition, but she truly embodies the warrior's lifestyle, which was taught to her by the warlords of Okara. They have a deep value for life, and in their eyes, in order to truly be a warrior, you must embody compassion and mercy, knowing when to favor them over bloodshed. Coriander embodied these values, as she demonstrated when Blackfire tried to kill her during their graduation duel. Cory nearly killed Commander by accident when she was just trying to dismount her, but she chose to save her instead of letting her fall to her death, even though Blackfire had been trying to kill and torture her throughout the whole match, and let's be real, for most of their lives. During her years of enslavement and experimentation, her heart became increasingly hardened. And by the time Cory reached Earth, her readiness to kill was only outweighed by her own tolerance for pain. This was a big plot point in the comics where over time she had to acclimate to Earth's morality and become more of an Earth-based hero instead of an alien warrior. But that was only possible because Cory's compassion and empathy was really as big as her combat readiness, as long as you didn't appear to be a threat. Now, I don't know how much of this they had in mind when they started writing for this show, but I watched a whole season of Cory snapping people's necks, beating them into submission, and then killing them anyway, throwing cops downstairs, etc. And if your response to that is, well, she had amnesia, of course she was confused, what do you expect? This is why amnesia plot points are dumb. We had to sit through 10 episodes of this woman acting like anyone but herself and then another whole season of her just barely resembling the character. First impressions matter and our first impression of Starfire in live action was not an enduring one. But that's not even the biggest reason why Anna Fire has been so extremely divisive. My personal opinion, Anna Jope and her portrayal of Starfire were doomed from day damn one. And it was all because of those leaked images we got of Anna in her season one attire. When those shits hit the internet, the well was poisoned. They really did fuck Anna over by having this be her season one getup. And this is how we would see her for the first time. But Anna Main, I hear some of y'all rearing up to say, they were gonna hate on her anyway because she's a black woman. Oh, we're going there. Hope you don't think we weren't. I just saved the best or worst for last. I remember when the Titans casting was announced back in 2017. And this too was fucked Ooh. from day damn one. Day damn one, Vivian. Day damn one. But amidst all the bullshit and bigotry was a large amount of support from longtime Teen Titans fans like myself and people who were just generally into cape shit. The support of clapbacks paired with a generally large amount of hype eventually drowned out all the hatred by the time we got our eyes on the cast in costume. And then it came back full throttle, prompting the return of the Anna Fire Defenders. And I don't fault them for doing what they did, but I do think that in the process, well-meaning critical fans got swept up and lumped in with the trolls and racists. So now, anyone who critiques Anna Fire gets called a racist, just like the guy calling her Shaniqua Fire. Valid questions like, why isn't she orange or gold, get labeled as anti-blackness. Questions that we still don't have actual answers for, by the way. I mean, Starfire's been everything from bright gold, to high tangerine, to deep dark orange. And in the animated shows, half the time, she damn near look human. I spent my teenage years watching Teen Titans thinking that she was just colored like a light-skinned black person or a Latina. It was more like tan with orange undertones. It wasn't like full-blown orange or full-blown gold. You want to sit here and tell me why you can't give her orange skin and green eyes? You can't tell me that. No, literally you can't because plenty of fans have already done the work and made actual digital concept art with Anna Jope redesigned to actually have orange skin and long flowing red hair and green eyes. 
I love a lot of the different looks for Starfire, but I think with Anna's skin tone, that deep orange that she had in the new 52 would have been perfect for her. Online fans do it, cosplayers do it. Shout out to Cutie Pie Sensei, who is my personal favorite Starfire cosplayer. And it damn sure wasn't a budgetary issue. Adobe subscriptions started like $20 a month. So they either could have gotten her body paint for less than the cost of a DoorDash order or done it in post. But these valid critiques got lost in the sea of calling out racists and trolls. And it wasn't from all of the Anna Fire Defenders. I want to make that clear. It wasn't all of them, but it was enough of them to arise the ire of the Anna Fire critics. Those harsher, more extreme elements would start to ramp up and fire back at the Anna Fire Defenders, calling them all types of SJWs and triggered sensitive snowflakes and blah, blah, blah. And then here come the other side firing back with more racist neck beards. Every time the subject is brought up on Twitter, on YouTube, anywhere, it's just two extremes clashing against each other. And it starts this back and forth that just never ends. This is also where you start getting things that just aren't true or that don't make sense. Like Starfire was initially a black woman or the Cartoon Network version was the lead in a series of whitewashes and that she's black coded. When your two choices are extremes of this magnitude, what's the point of even participating in this discussion? No wonder the conversation's so depressing. And in the middle of it all is an actress who really just showed up to play a role and in my opinion was way too good for this fuck ass of a show. If you are a fan of Anna Fire, I hope that after watching this video, you can see the issues that people have had that aren't just skin deep. There's plenty of room to do your own thing, but you can't wet a fandom's appetite with the chance of giving them their favorite dish, then bring out something entirely different and then get mad when they call you out for it. And to the other side, I did my best to lay the case out without giving credence to the more ignorant sides of the fandom. And that includes the people who are more in alignment with my opinions. I encourage you to leave your thoughts in the comments and let's have a conversation. But please, for the love of Zal, let it be a productive one, or at the very least, a civil one. But even if we can't come together on this topic, at the end of the day, as the late Too Mad once said, that's all right. Because I'm done with this video, which means I never have to watch Titans again. I can move on and not have this cloud hanging over me anymore. Thank you for watching. Get you some more Alien Warrior Hippie Princess in your life by clicking this video right here. Good night, girl. I'll see you tomorrow. Fuck this show!